Okay, so hopefully you're here to learn uh, how to troubleshoot and triage like a pro. Uh, so what we'll do is, is is we'll walk through just some background on who we are um, and then tell a lot of stories about times we learned some hard lessons, some good lessons um, about how to, you know, how to, how to handle yourselves when an incident starts, how to handle you and your team when multiple incidents start and how to prioritize what we're doing there uh, to make sure that not only we're taking care of, of the issues and taking care of clients, but also taking care of ourselves as well. This is a little bit about me. Um, all the different ways to find me online uh, are SQL at speed, GitHub, Twitter, LinkedIn, blog, all that stuff. Um, I occasionally get to drive race cars. So that's kind of the handle that I picked years and years ago. Um, and it, like I said, I, I welcome it, any and all feedback on, on this session, any way that you would like to hand it over to me. Um, if you think the session was great, feel free to tweet about it. Um, if you didn't like it, and especially didn't like my part, email me. Uh, do not tell anybody else. Uh, in all seriousness, though, we always want these to be good, and we always want to improve for the next time. So any feedback is very welcome. This is a little bit about me. Um, what I want to draw your attention to here is this last point. So I run the local user group where, where I live. And, uh, you know, I got involved in the SQL community probably about nine years ago. Um, it's no exaggeration to say that getting involved in starting to attend events, eventually helping to organize and speak and all of that has changed my life. Um, it's changed my work life. It's changed my personal life. I've, I've made really good friends through this as well. So if this is your first time at any sort of an event like this, thanks for coming. Um, please stay. Please stay involved. Uh, you, I, I like to say that, that the worst case is you're going to learn something that you don't know when you attend one of these. Everything after that, you could meet somebody that's going to be the link to your next job. You could make a friend. You could meet somebody that's going to be the link to a next job for, for a good friend of yours. Um, it, it, it opens up a lot of possibilities and you're also helping to stay current in your job and learn lots of cool stuff. And so hopefully we will be able to help you do that as well. One more thing. Um, so my company, we are a software as a service billing company headquartered in Atlanta, uh, but open to remote work around the world. Uh, my team is hiring actually right now. So I'll put these slides up on GitHub once we're done. Uh, and that, that'll that be SQL at speed on there. Uh, these links will be available to you. You can also go to jobs.rev.io to learn more about it. Uh, probably for this group, uh, the cloud data administrator would be the most interesting thing. Uh, but we always love to give a chance to somebody who who finds out about us from community style events like this. So if you're looking, if you have a friend that's looking, hopefully you will check that out and be in touch. But that is enough about me and what my company wants to do. Deep sea, all yours. Thank you, Matt. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time for attending Data Platform Summit. Um, I, I'm sure you will learn a lot from this. all of these sessions. Um, myself, I'm Deepti Goguri. I'm a database administrator, and it, all the contact details are here. I'm very active on Twitter as well as LinkedIn, and that's a blog underneath there, like dbnuggets.com. I usually blog about SQL Server. So if you are interested in looking this, please go ahead and look into my website. Um, next slide, Matt. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a, I'm a database administrator, like I said, having seven plus years of experience. Actually, it's the eight plus. I forgot to change that. Uh, I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. Um, I did my master's in computer technology here in United States in Chicago. And uh, the last one, the the last uh, the last point is important to me. Uh, I'm a leader for. I'm a co-organizer for a couple of user groups. I'm a co-organizer for Microsoft Data and AI South Florida user group, and also I'm a co-organizer for the diversity, equity, and inclusion user group. And also I volunteer for women in technology as well. Um, yeah, I love doing the volunteer stuff. Uh, so, and also I'm a friend of it, Kate. 
And you're also uh, part of a DEI panel later today at DPS as oh, well, yes. right? Yes, so it's it's actually on 23rd. I'm, a, I'm one of the panelists for the diversity, equity, and inclusion panel discussion. Yes. Thank you so much, Matt, <laughs> for reminding me. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. So you've learned about us a bit. So before we dive into story time, uh, let's go over some some terms. So triage may not be a term that everybody's familiar with. Um, and just in case they're not, then I'm going to walk through kind of what I think that means. So from a DBA perspective, and, and this, this session is not exclusive to DBAs, because um, I think anybody in the data world has probably had to solve a problem under pressure at some point. Um, but we kind of focused on DBAs as part of this because that's what our background is. And also, it, I think it's it's most often where somebody in a data role, the DBA is the one that's kind of under fire. Generally, something's gone down or somebody thinks something's gone down and it's their primary responsibility to fix it. So we're not, we don't want to exclude anyone, uh, but definitely wrote this from the perspective of our background. And sometimes things go down and you're getting yelled at and you have to fix those things. So what triage kind of means to us is, Knowing what to fix is just as important as knowing how to fix it. Um, I, I've worked with some people who were very technically skilled over the years, but under pressure, um, didn't always make the decisions that led to the best outcomes. Um, and, and a lot of it was this. It's that they had massive amounts of technical knowledge. But when they're under pressure, when somebody's yelling at them or somebody's saying, well, if we're down five more minutes, the company's going to be fine a million dollars or whatever it might be, um, that they weren't making good decisions under fire about prioritizing what the fix is and kind of getting to that point. And we've got some stories later that I think kind of underscore this. Uh, we certainly have to know the tech, right? Because we have to know how to fix whatever broke, but we also have to understand how to prioritize all of the issues that are coming in and how to get to the point where we know what to fix. Um, these issues are not always simple and they don't always come in with an obvious error and we know exactly what to go do. Um, as that second bullet says, prioritization matters even more when you're on under pressure. Um, it's good. You know, I always like to set a priority order for the day for myself and for my team as well. And on a day when nothing breaks, um, that, that can be very nice. You've got a good sense of order to your day and all of that. But a lot of times, and certainly early in my career, um, when I was under pressure, that prioritization would go out the window and I wouldn't bring that sense of order to the issues that I was trying to fix. And as I've learned over the years, which is part of the reason this session exists, um, this is even more important when you're, when you're under fire. Um, you need to understand what's important and what's not, and then work through the fixes from there. Uh, and this also means that your troubleshooting starts off with a sense of order, with a sense of calm. Um, you know, it's not uncommon for people in, in our spots to be facing multiple incidents at the same time. Somebody says the database is down. Maybe we're all we're also hearing from, from the web team or something like that, that, oh, we're having problems with web servers and we think it's the database's fault. So we're dealing maybe with multiple incidents or one incident that's manifesting itself in multiple ways. Um, kind of cutting through that noise and using some of the tips we're going to talk about later really help a lot because if you start if you start the troubleshooting and the instant handling from a place of calm, uh, you're going to do a better job. You know, I know a, a lot of times I think people in this role you kind of feel like a superhero uh, when you're asked to fix something. You're able to do whatever it takes to do that, and you fix something, and that's awesome, uh, and it's a great feeling. But starting from that sense of calm, maybe the rush is different, um, but you're going to be able to repeat that process more and more and more uh, because odds are we're not always just going to face one incident in our life. That That is for sure. Okay, so uh, let's dive into this a little bit more. So uh, we'll, bear, we'll break this word down. So that was a lot of talking by me. Uh, let's break this word down in two bullet points here. So prioritize issues versus incidents. So 
the incident I think for me is is the broad thing that's happened. You know, our application is down. Our customers are saying things are down. We're broken. What whatever the phrasing is there, um, that's the incident. And then what our what our responsibility is, and certainly working with the teams that are feeding us this information, whether it's customer support, whether it's app devs, whether it's operations. Um, is we break it down to what the individual issues are. And it may just be one, perhaps the database is actually down and we need to take steps to bring that back up. Uh, but it could be multiple issues as well. And, and we'll talk about some of this, you know, just because somebody says the database is down, that may not mean it's going to manifest itself that same way. From their perspective, that's what they're thinking, but they're actually technically wrong. And so just breaking the incident down into issues will help us a lot. And we can then prioritize those and handle those. Um, we also need to distribute these as well. So when we have an incident broken down into the issues that comprise it, uh, we're able to distribute those out. And we'll hear some stories later about times where you know, it was reported to the DBA team that the database was down. It wasn't truly down. It was actually a different issue. And once you, you know, the quicker you're able to identify that and then distribute that to the team that can actually fix it, uh, the better off not only you're going to be, but anybody using your app is going to be much happier when it comes back up. And then finally, after we've done this, um, we can attack. We can actually fix the issues that we're able to fix. And, uh, and you know, a lot, a lot of times, like I said, these incidents uh, are comprised of more than one issue. So while the DBA team is handling our business, the other teams are able to handle those because we've taken the time to break the incident down into these issues, get it into the hands of the teams that need to have it. And, uh, and hopefully we're in a much better spot than we were when the incident started. Okay, so I am going to play the role of a developer. Uh, so if you're a DBA, you've probably had a conversation uh, with a developer similar to this. So I'm going to sound like some of the developers that I have worked with over the years. Oh, my query is running so slow. Deep Thief, my query is slow. Okay, okay, Matt, I understand that, but can you tell a little bit more about it? Because when you say the query is running slow, does that mean that it used to be running fine previously? And how long was it taking previously? And now, how we, how, how, I mean, what is the difference between the performance? Like, is it running slow, really slow? And did you make any changes to, to your code? Like, did you change the code? Did you drop any indexes or do you have any release? I need more information, Matt. Ah, oh, you DBAs are so difficult. It was working fine. I didn't change anything. Of course, I didn't change anything. It was working fine. But suddenly, it's slow. Do you know why? Oh, if you ask me suddenly, I can't tell the answer because I need to figure out what is the problem. Once a wise man said, if you define the problem correctly, you almost have the solution. So first, we need to understand what is the problem. So if you face any problem, like if a developer come to you and say like, hey, my query is running slow and you have no idea because there is nothing to back up for that claim, right? So you need to first figure out the problem. And if a developer comes to you and then he will put everything upon you and as a DBA, you need to go ahead and look for several things from the perspective, from the DBA perspective. So if you see, like, if if a developer comes to you and says, like, my query is running slow, as a DBA, what are your minimum, like, the bare minimum steps that you take to find out the problem? So as a DBA, what I do is, like, I do not know where the problem is. So first thing that I do from the SQL Server perspective is, like, uh, go and run certain DMVs to figure out, like, if the query is actually running or is it waiting? If it is waiting, what upon what resources it is waiting? It can be the CPU, memory, it can be storage, IO issues, right? Or if it is like running, why is it taking so, so much time? Is it taking the high amount of resources? Or it can be the inefficient query plan. So there are certain scenarios when your query plan is terrible, right? Um, like if you are if you are having the stale statistics, and you know that if you have stale statistics, if your statistics are not up to date, then that will cause the uh, problem. Like 
the memory grants that are released for a query execution will be like way above or way less um depending upon how bad your statistics are so to, to keep the statistics up to date is important but if your statistics are stale then the memory grants to the queries are affected and that will cause the inefficient query plan to be generated and your query plans the operators inside the query plans will be changed right and there can be an operator which is taking way too long when it doesn't have to take so much long and sometimes the it might be indexes if you drop certain indexes if you do not have efficient indexes wherever it has to do the table speak uh, for just a couple of uh, records it is doing the entire scan of the table you need to make sure where the problem is existing right and it can be the query itself the query that the developer has written is like really terrible he did not follow the standards so you need to make sure like say developer these are our standards as a dba we document these things and for a reason we give that to you you need to go ahead and make sure you you rewrite the query and come back to me if you have the issue or it can be a temp db problem there can be the contention problem or it can be the sos uh, so it's a yielding weight uh, where the cpu memory is taking um cpu memory those resources are mm, taking too much for the query execution it can be anything so defining the problem is the first thing we need to do that is so true um yeah it's and a lot of these can feel really large right until we kind of break them down into their individual parts um you know much much like we talked about breaking down an incident into issues breaking down a slow query into kind of the individual components can can make that a, a lot easier to fix and and just a lot easier to process um so before we dive into story time i uh, did want to point out so um, this platform does not allow you to unmute and speak to us directly uh, but we definitely want to make this as interactive as as we possibly can uh, so there is a question pane and a chat pane, I believe. Um, go ahead and use those, and we will monitor the chat that will be presented to us in our chat, and uh, and then we we will monitor those and uh, put those in as uh, as time allows. But we should have some time for that. So definitely, questions, comments, whatever, we are uh, uh, very open to those. Story time. Okay, so I will, I will start out here, um, and, and these are all real stories. I didn't make these up. Uh, you know, I've I've been an on-call DBA on and off uh, over the years, and I was also a consultant as well. So uh, some of these come from the on-call DBA part of my life. Uh, some come from the consultant part. But they're all real and and true. I I'm not making these up at all. Uh, have changed some names to protect people that maybe don't come off so well in this story, uh, but. This is all stuff that happened. So we'll start with a four hour outage that was my fault. Uh, great way to start, right? So I say mostly my fault. So that we did have a technical issue. Um, so I used to work for a place where uh, our, our main product line was government benefit redemption for food programs and things like that here, here in the USA. Um, and so we were required to be up 24 7 365 because a lot of times grocery stores are open then and if the families need to go get their food for their kids at that point in time our system needs to be up and needed to be able to take that transaction so the family could buy that food with with their card and feed their kids and that all routed through our system so outages were bad um and the particular program we were servicing here in, in the States um, was administered individually by each state. So we didn't have a contract with the federal government for all 50 states. We had individual contracts with each state. Um, some of the states here are quite small. Some of the states are very large. And uh, I, I can't name the state, but this particular one was with a large state, one of our larger clients um, with a very... Uh, a very difficult contract for us. So we were not allowed any downtime beyond um, essentially a scheduled 30 minutes every quarter. And 
beyond if downtime exceeded that the company could be fined a thousand dollars a minute um i say that to point out that this four hour outage 240 minutes could have potentially cost us two hundred and forty thousand dollars. so i was under a bit of pressure uh, so what happened is we had we had an issue overnight. We were running always on availability groups, usually three to four nodes for every state. So we were administering at that point um, about 80 servers because we had contracts with about 20 states. And we had an issue with this large state's environment. The always on AG failed over um, as it should. We had automatic failover set for it. Um, it was, you know, it handled, we thought, all that part right. But as it started to bring up the resources after the failover, things did not go well. Um, not, you know, we I could probably have a whole session on cluster issues with always on availability groups, but uh, we'll just kind of go the, the very top level version of this here. Um, we in we ended up in a split brain scenario with the cluster under the always on ag um there had been some things done uh by our data and operations group to try to speed up the failover those were tested but probably not under every scenario um, those caused an issue here the resolution actually would have been pretty straightforward had i chosen to be patient but I was, you know, and this is several years ago. I'd like to think I've learned a couple of things since then. Um, I was in a bit of a panic state because I, in my head, I'm doing the math and thinking of the fine from the client as we're down. Um, and like I said, it could have been upwards of $200,000. So I made a bad decision and actually triggered a scenario in the always on AG to the point where we had to call Microsoft support to fix it. So the, the takeaway from this, and, and we'll get to some resolutions that actually would have helped me, but the takeaway personally from this story is even in high pressure scenarios where, you know, I could almost envision like a display in my room counting that fine. Um, patience is a virtue. Uh, you know, we had documented actually the fix for this particular problem. And I, you know, did not bring enough patience to the table to take five minutes to go find the document and, you know, did something basically that, that I shouldn't have done trying to get the always on AT back up uh, because I was impatient. Simple as that. It was not a lack of technical knowledge. It wasn't a lack of process. It wasn't a lack of documentation. It was a, it was a failure on, on my part. So what were the lessons learned here? So we just, I, I kind of spoiler alerted this slide on, on the last one, but first things first, relax and calm down. Um, that's really what I needed there. You know, as, as always, these failovers rarely happen when you're, when you've slept well, when it's the middle of the day, when you have time to handle it, right? This, this was overnight. This was around, you know, 3 a.m., and our particular escalation process at that point in time uh, relied on some of the folks who were nighttime operators for us who would monitor things and then call the on-call folks. And, uh, and you know, they, they tended to be excitable. So this incident started with basically a loud phone call filled with swear words that we had a big client that was down. And I very much kind of uh, took that in and, and approached this incident in that same sort of panicky state. Uh, I do not recommend that. I should have gotten up from my chair. I should have taken a deep breath. Um, and I should have thought through what we needed to do there. Um, so from a personal standpoint, just standing up, doing one of those helps a lot. That'll help get your mind right. From a technical standpoint, uh, trust your monitoring that you had. We didn't have as big a problem as I thought, and the monitoring indicated that. What happened was I was getting a scary error that I had seen before, but in my head, I've already kind of started in this panic state. You know, I've not taken 30 seconds at the start to be like, okay, let's get our mind right. Let's focus on what the issues might be. I pretty much took what the operator said as gospel and approached it that way. And it really wasn't as bad as they said, yes, we were down, but it would have been a relatively simple fix. So if your monitoring is telling you 
yes, there's an error, but there's only one, or yes, there's a problem in this particular component of whatever, trust it. You've, I hope, spent time either creating your own, or if you're fortunate enough to have have the budget to have a tool, um, you have vetted that tool and you trust it and you know that it's going to give you very good information back and you can use that information to fix things. Um, so combine those tools, use whatever you've got, um, and then make sure you have a library of, of scripts and things like that um, specific to the issue at hand. So I did say we documented this right, and we did. The catch there was it was in SharePoint. It wasn't easy to find. Uh, it was one of those things that was not, you know, our let's say our filing process as a team wasn't very good. Uh, filing process as a company wasn't very good. Things were very disorganized. Um, and so the document was out there. I was like, well, it's going to take too long to find it. I'll just do what I think is the best thing when I should have taken the time to find it. But like I said, that finding it would have been easy. So here's kind of a modern version of this. So Azure Data Studio did not exist when this happened to me. It does now. And though it's kind of marketed as a tool, a lightweight tool for database development, and it very much is that, it can be very handy for DBAs as well. So our runbooks at this point in time were Word documents that, like I said, were stored in SharePoint. The, the indexing and stuff wasn't very good in there. They weren't always easy to find. If Had I had an Azure Data Studio notebook with the scripts I needed to resolve the problem I have, I could have saved it with an appropriate title, put it in source control as well. So, so not only could I find it, everybody on my team could as well. And if I made any changes or if they made any changes to it, those would be stored in source control as well. That's looking back what we should have done. And we should have had the document more readily available now as well. But now in the year 2022, um, Azure Data Studio can be a big help for this stuff. So the technical takeaway from this one here is Azure Data Studio for DBAs can be really great. Um, so take advantage of that. And if, if you're in a scenario where you're exchanging runbooks with an overnight monitoring team or your team or whatever, um, ADS notebooks are awesome. And I know Deep Thee has a session on that as well. So if you want more information on those, uh, seek out that session as well. A um, couple just quick things here. So if you're not fortunate enough to have, if you're running always on availability groups, and you're not fortunate enough to have a third party tool um, and you're, you have to write your own scripts. And that was the position that I was in. Um, these, so one of these is on my GitHub, which is basically the always on quick monitoring script that I used to run. That was as soon as I would sit down, I would run that and it would give me information about my AG within a couple seconds. So I didn't have to pull up a dashboard. I didn't have any third party tools. Then this was always the first step that I did. So that's available on my GitHub, if you'd like to see that. And then the Microsoft Tiger team um, over the years has compiled a really nice library of always on availability group related scripts, um, lots of troubleshooting in there, uh, some monitoring things, things like that. So you can follow that second link there for all those. I've certainly used them. Um, they're very, very helpful. And they're written by the folks that also write the code. So that tends to be helpful as well. Okay, so we, we started with an outage that was my fault. We're going to continue with one that was not my fault. Uh, so we had a daytime client outage. Thankfully, it was not the large client this time. So we didn't have the, the specter of a fine hanging over our head. Um, but outages, as I mentioned, for that system were pretty bad because if our system was down and, and, and a young mom and her kid went to get their food, um, and they were not able to, which we've impacted some somebody's life. So obviously we were trying not to do that. We were there to help, uh, not to harm. So uh, any outages were bad. Uh, but this, you know, this one didn't trigger a fine, but it, it still didn't look good and made us feel very bad. Uh, so what happened this time? So I had, you know, I, I actually remember it was a Friday, very nice Friday. It was one of those Fridays where it was nice outside and you're like, you're starting to get to the mid late afternoon. Like, I just want to leave. I just want to go for a walk, go sit outside, whatever. Um, it was exactly that kind of day. And I'm sitting there kind of putting the wraps on a, on a week. And all of a sudden, all of our monitoring starts to fire. 
that we have lost completely um, connection to one of the client databases out of nowhere. Very strange. So as I mentioned, for each individual state, we had an individual always on AG. And so there were individual clusters under there as well. At that point, we weren't sharing resources between contracts at, at all. So one of the newer operations folks that they were training in, in the ways of storage administration and all of that, um, they were walking, they were training that person on the cluster validation wizard. So if you're not familiar with that, that's when you set up a Windows Server failover cluster, which used to be required for always on AGs, isn't exactly now. Um, you would walk through all these steps. There's a checkbox towards the end where you could check to say validate storage. If you did that, it would validate every volume, but it, part of that process was by briefly taking the volume offline to run through some of its checks. So I'll stop here and let's think about what we're doing. We're running an always on availability group. So a number of SQL server databases in that group on top of a cluster that is now having each individual volume in the cluster <laughs> offline. What happened next? Everything went down. So it basically SQL Server lost its mind. The service crashed because it was losing, it couldn't find TempDB, it couldn't find its data files, couldn't find its log files. They all came back, but by that point the service had crashed because it had the storage ripped out from underneath it. So what happened next was a very angry, loud call. So at that point, our daytime escalation procedures were what we called a hotline, where we would have somebody in the communications part of the company that had to talk to customers and all that, they would, uh, you know, whichever one of us saw the incident first, we would trigger the hotline call and then it would have technical people on it. It would have operations, comms, all those folks. Um, this one did not start off in a good way. So very angry, very loud, um, you know, because everybody was kind of tuned in because it was daytime. Uh, so we didn't start off in a good place at all. And it, you know, there was the potential for blame here, right? So what lessons did we learn here? So in this case, I had to calm others down. So, so the call started and I was quite confident that I, I had a pretty good guess as to what had happened because I knew I wasn't doing anything to offline any storage. Um, I wasn't even connected to the box. Nobody on, on my team was uh, anything like that. I needed to start by calming people down because we had a couple folks jump in um, using very unprofessional language, <laughs> being very angry. And in order for us to get to an appropriate resolution and figure out what the issue actually was, because it was complicated, uh, we needed to get everybody calmed down and get everybody on the call quieted down that didn't need to be talking. So that can be a difficult skill, especially if, if, if you're newer at, you know, at this point I wasn't brand new, um, but in my career, I would say I was still fairly young. Um, it, my advice there, if you're like, well, I don't know, I don't know that I, I don't feel like I know enough or I'm confident enough to take control of this call. If you know that that's what it needs, um, kind of faking it until you make it is pretty good advice there. And that's what I had to do in, in, this circumstance, you know, telling people that outranked me, the CEO, things like that, I need you to stop talking because we need to focus on what the problem is. We'll worry about, you know, figuring out who did it and why later. Right now, it's about getting it fixed, getting it back up. So when families are out getting their food, they can. Uh, so be prepped to calm others down, uh, be confident in yourself and what you are seeing. And, and in this case, like I said, I, I had experience with this. I actually had seen a session at a SQL Saturday warning of this very thing um, from an experience always on AG person and said, listen, when clusters are set up or if you're, you know, if you have a storage person or a cluster person that's looking at this stuff while everything's running and they choose to validate it, here are the issues that can happen. Um, so I had to be confident enough in myself to kind of hazard that initial guess. But the third bullet is really what helped me a lot here is, and this is a, actually a story from, from, from another session that I give, 
but <clears throat> when you're running complicated infrastructure and always on availability groups are that, but they're not the only example of that. So when you're running something where the database is relying on complicated storage, complicated networking, all those sorts of things. And this is true on-prem or in, in the cloud as well, because the cloud, you know, we may not always be in touch with all the hardware there, but the networking complexity there can be the same thing. If you have a basic understanding of the infrastructure under your database, it will help you build a case. And in this circumstance, I had had another incident where basically I was forced to understand how the cluster operated and where the storage lived and all that. Because previously I had just had that team handle it. I thought I didn't need to know that I'm the data person. I'm not the operations person. But another incident had revealed to me that I very much did need to understand that. And it paid off here because I was able to say what the database was doing at that point in time. I was able to go into the cluster log and point out what had happened. And then we started to set about fixing it and uh, understanding why it happened. Another tip here, um, hotlines can be very good. This was definitely a severity one incident. You know, we had a state completely down. The database was offline. The SQL server service had crashed. Um, hotlines can be very good for incidents like that because once we got everybody calmed down, I was able to talk to our director of operations, kind of walk through the error messages that he and I saw in our different logs, quickly understand what happened and handle it. But we also had a lot of loud, angry executive people on the phone. They were not helpful. So that's kind of a reminder um, it, when you're going to establish these hotlines and things like that. Uh, make sure the right people are on them. And like I said, don't be afraid to seize control of it, even if there may be people that have much more important titles than you. Those titles don't matter. When you're there trying to fix stuff, the priority is very much that. All right, this is my last bit of story time before I turn things back over. So this is more recent. Um, and this is, as the title says, the client says we're down. So um, this is an app that I had, that I was supporting from a consulting type role. And there was monitoring around the app. We also had um, very dedicated uh, customer support people as well that noticed that the app performance had degraded significantly that afternoon. Um, it was, you know, especially people that work in a system a lot, you have a certain sense, whatever the monitoring is saying or not, that, hey, this isn't right. This is taking too long. This is not its normal behavior at this time of day. Um, that was very much something that happened here. Backed up by that, so we're getting these sporadic reports of things being slow, not uncommon, right? Um, backed up with that, we had a couple clients calling and say, hey, your app is completely down. When I do this thing on this screen, I get a database error. Um, so I'll pause there and think through what I just said. They called and said the app was completely down, but when they took an action on a screen, now I'll stop there, that means we weren't down. So we talked about er earlier breaking incidents down into issues. Something like that, and this story really is kind of built around that concept. Um, they said it was down, but they also said they were in the app doing activity. So sometimes what people say isn't always what they mean, and this is certainly a circumstance like that. From their perspective, it was down because they couldn't do the things they needed to do, but they were in the application moving around. There was a particular workflow for them that didn't function and they got a database error. They reported it to customer support without a screenshot, without details. Um, so then support as they would, because they're not always technical um, or as technical as we are, um, it was passed along specifically to the database team. So this particular place had a broader infrastructure team that handled networking, that handled storage, all those sorts of things, than a database team that was part of that broader team. It was passed directly to the database team who kind of immediately went down the rabbit hole of, well, tell me what, you know, we were, we were talking to engineering, like, well, tell us the code that that screen runs. And if it's a, if it's a query timeout, do we have an execution plan issue or something like that? As the fourth bullet says, and it kind of gives away the story here, it wasn't a database issue at all. And had we taken the time to, 
parse what the customer and what our customer support folks had said, we would have realized that things were just slow. And had we engaged the broader team, because the database issue was a timeout, and it was it happened to be part of their migration project where there were some resources in Azure, there were some resources on-premises, uh, and there was latency between those. There was a problem with the circuit uh, between Azure and between the data centers, and that was the problem. That was causing database timeouts. It was all manifesting as timeout errors in the app connecting to the database, but latency was the actual issue. So what are some takeaways from that? Then I will stop talking. So just because somebody says the database is down doesn't mean it is. Um, in complicated environments, things like this are not always what they appear to be. And so it's always good to take a very holistic view of something like this, You know, carefully analyze the tickets when they come in, if it's down or if they're reporting an error, ask for screenshots, ask for text of, of the error, search your logs and see if you can find them. Because just because somebody outside or even somebody internal in a support role has said the database is having a problem doesn't mean it is. So you wanna take that holistic view with all of the, all of the support teams to better understand that. Um, ensure that every part of your infrastructure is monitored and you know what that baseline speed looks like. Um, this actually exposed a gap in our monitoring that we had. We trusted our network providers monitoring on their circuit. We didn't own the circuit. Um, their monitoring reported that it was healthy. It was not. And we were able to show that to them by setting up some other monitoring on, on each side. Um, but this did expose a gap that we were able to fill and, uh, and they never had that problem again, which is good. Which kind of brings us to the last takeaway for this story before I turn things back over. Monitoring does not begin and end at the database level. So we're a lot of data people sitting here, right? So database monitoring, we know very well. Infrastructure type monitoring, maybe we don't know that well. And if you don't, uh, and you're fortunate enough to be in Azure, um, Azure Log Analytics is a way for us to get a ton of information at a very modest cost. We're not having to buy a third party tool to do that. Uh, that this deserves its own session, which we obviously don't have time for. The link here on the bottom of this slide is a great way to get started with understanding the basics of using log analytics to monitor all of your infrastructure and not just the data components. And that is certainly enough for me. So Deepthi, over to you. Thank you, Matt. Those stories are so wonderful. I mean, I learned a lot from those. I'm sure audience also learned a lot. So, um, Regarding my stories, there are a couple of stories like, but the first one is like application team. So this problem that I'm going to talk about uh, is like a problem that we have since like several months, but then finally we fixed it. So the application team, the application couldn't connect to the database intermittently. That is not happening like right at the moment. Once we fix it, everything is fine. It's not like that. It was like intermittent. Um, and the error that we are seeing is like a very generic error, like timeout, generic database timeout error. So, of course, application team, they, they just say, like, everything is fine from their side, but the problem is occurring from the database side, and they couldn't know what the problem is, and they just uh, told, like, DBS, you are the ones who have to solve this problem. This is a database problem, and for, they are very sure about it. But once we get the issue, the first thing that we do as a DBA, of course, we will go ahead and look into those error logs, right? So there is nothing, there is nothing whatsoever on in the error log, not even the connections. It, it is not even showing that the connections are made making up to the database. So that itself says like it is not a SQL Server problem. So I just let them know that we are not even having any connections here. So it's not the database problem. But then they were like so sure something is happening in between, but they couldn't figure it out. But they are so sure that it is not an application problem. So I thought like, and that is happening since several months. So what the application team does to resolve the issue temporarily for those months is to uh, refresh their uh, pool, the application pool, those application connection pool, so that once they reset, the connections are back again. But once the connections are filled and they couldn't connect to the database, that's when the error happens again. 
and then they refresh the application pool and this is like a cycle it happens all the time since several months but they couldn't figure it out so as a dba i got this i was just a lone dba there um so what i did was like i know this is not a this is not a database issue i checked everywhere error log dmvs connections if there is any blocking what what not i checked everything but then i thought like if i sit here like a dba and then just say like it's not a dba thing i don't want to care about it that that is not going to help the situation and solve the problem and this problem has been there since several months so i thought uh, let me take the step back and then take the hat of a developer from the developer's perspective and they set up a i set up a meeting with the developer team and i started looking into the application i took their help because i am not a developer i do not know anything about it but then i had these ideas i did lot of research online you know we 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 do so much of online task right googling things um we need to know how to google the issues uh, so i was like everywhere on stack overflow i found something like from the application side perspective so i set up a meeting with the developer team and we went we went ahead and we started looking into the application itself and we figured it out that the connections that are actually opening up to the database so they are explicitly opening up the application uh, opening up the connections to the uh, database but they are not explicitly co- closing the connections so those connections that are made to the database are open so as they are open there is certain amount of um, connection that can be made from the application perspective right so once they are, that pool is filled they couldn't make any more connections to the database so they had to restart the application pool to make the connection again but then once it is full it, they cannot make the connections anymore so that is actually a problem from the application code itself so once we figured out the problem um because that is a very old code that they are using i mean if you know the vb code the oldest code that everybody want to trash it out and rewrite their applications again so the suggestion was to rewrite the application so once they rewrote the application uh, explicitly mentioning the closing of the connections along with the opening connection that when that's when the problem was completely solved but then it is not so easy to rewrite the application so until the uh, until that problem is being solved they were like restarting the pool because there is no other way to solve that issue they need to manually go ahead and change each and every connection within that vb code which is not like not worth it because they anyway want to rewrite the application so that was the so that was the actual problem and that was the resolution to rewrite the rewrite the application it's a broader like when i step back and look at from the broader perspective it is not even a database problem but then if i decided to sit back and say like hey it's not a dba problem then it's not going anywhere the problem is being persisted and it is not solved so what did i learn from it next slide man so what did i learn from it i stepped out of my comfort zone as a dba and i took the hat of the application uh, developer job but then i worked with the developers to figure it out it took couple of weeks to actually decide that it was the connection pool problem connection problem but then we finally figured it out so remaining calm uh, during the chaos is really important because everybody thought like it is a it is a database issue because if, like the error itself shows like a timeout error and that is a database error but the thing is like not always the error shows what they actually mean and if you are a dba you very well know about this thing right the error so shows something but then the actual problem is something else so to figure out at the starting point of my investigation i use this tool dynatrace tool so if somebody asks like is there any tool out there um the multi layered monitoring tool like starting all the way from the application till the database till it hits the database those connections how they are going through passing through different layers right um i can say that dynatrace tool is a very good tool to um to know like where the problem is actually where the weirdness is happening from the application in the database so i checked the dynatrace tool and i figured it out there is no not the connections are not made to the database itself 
so that's when i went back and look into the application the second story of mine is backups and when i say the backups you'll think like yeah i know what you're going to tell we need to have the valid database backups and make sure they are valid no that is not what i'm going to tell here but then we don't only need the database backups which are valid but also we need to uh, we need to also think in a different perspective of taking the backups of other things so what are these other things in my in my scenario it's replication so what can we back up right in the replication the metadata that you set up while you are setting up the replication those metadata information uh, we need to back up that so what kind of metadata we need right so you have this replication that you are going to set up but then you choose these are the articles that you wanted to replicate and if you have the filtering like any specific columns that you want to replicate that comes under the schema because if something broke and if something is gone if the replication is for example if it is deleted de deleted completely how do you get that metadata back again to create the replication again so in my scenario my manager asked a dba i went out for a lunch so i was on my lunch break and there was this junior dba out there and my manager called him and said like hey can you please pause the replication for a couple of hours because we are working on something else and we do not want the traffic between the publisher and the subscriber but the uh, developer uh, sorry the dba the junior dba he did not understand like the exact steps how to take and then he thought like he need to drop the publication and the subscriber so he went ahead and dropped the publication and he went and ahead and dropped the subscriber database as well and that's when like i was eating in a restaurant and i saw those emails hitting like those alerts from the monitoring tool saying like there is no subscriber out there and then publisher cannot connect to the distributor distributor can't distribute the uh, articles to the subscriber and those were like for every single second i am getting an alert so i rushed into the office and first thing i went ahead and i checked the replication monitor and i figured it out there is no subscriber out there there is no publication and everything is down and then from the subscriber perspective the subscriber database is used by uh, the research team they are doing some research on a statistics some kind of statistics and it is a very important database because they uh, they had certain articles that they need to pull up the reports and send it to them another location so everything got broke so how did i solve this problem because usually we do not keep the backups for the replication right these metadata information but the luckiest thing that happened to me at that particular point of time is like uh this particular publisher server we planned to migrate in couple of months so as a as a pre steps pre requisite i took the backup of this metadata just to be sure while setting up the replication all over again on the new servers i need this metadata right so that's when i took the backup and i used that backup and i restored everything i created the publication with those with that met metadata information and everything was fine but meanwhile my manager was like yelling at me because he thought like i i will take it over uh because i will assist him and he said like you do not have any documentation on it and how come how come you how come you uh um, let him do it when you are there like it's my lunch time nobody should ask me like why i am outside but that's what happened over there because everything was down so um what did i learn from this situation documentation definitely matters it, it might be easy upon your part like you might be thinking ha oh, it's very easy like few clicks you can set it up but then like documentation is here to stay like when somebody joined the company you need to pass over the the documentation they might not know how to, how exactly to do those steps and in your job in your company those steps might be different when compared with a different company right so you need to make sure those doc documentation really matters and when we talk about documentation i will really suggest to use the notebook sql notebooks to prepare those documentation so that you can easily share with the other colleagues and developers 
and also blaming doesn't help here uh, because the junior dba is already feeling very guilty he was like in a panic he almost thought he lost his job but then like yeah he need to move forward so um, so do not be afraid but please make sure you have valid backup next so this is my last story um so um please do not assume but please calm down and test so this is regarding the replication like i said um uh, i worked on replication a lot so i faced a lot of issues as well so the publisher here is 2012 and the subscriber is 2000 2000 server so if you observe the setup that we have to do is like microsoft doc shows like you can only do a uh, two versions up or two versions down to set up the replication but here the subscriber server like which is 2000 they do not want to upgrade this those servers so i had to figure out a way to repl- uh, like replicate in between the three version servers so somehow i figured it out i thought it is not possible because microsoft talks said that but then i thought like okay they are not ready to migrate the server so i planned i tested out and it worked out with certain challenges where i have to use the powershell uh, because when we take the snapshot of the database for the replication right the snapshot job those snapshot files had wrong settings like the ansi padding settings where they have to turn it on they are off so i can't just go ahead and change each and every file for every single snapshot agent um job when it runs when it creates a snapshot i just can't go ahead and change each and every file right so i used the powershell to make that possible to automatically change those settings to from off to on and i made sure i add that step within the snapshot job as a second step and that actually solved my problem so what did i learn from this next slide read the documentation but also do your testing i mean uh, if you test it out you might face the challenges but you can also find the resolution because not all the time the client is ready to migrate and do what is suggestible right um using powershell uh, script has actually helped me resolve the issues and if you do not know the dba tools like it's a powershell world completely powershell world to maintain your servers please go ahead and look that out and powershell is actually a king of automation right so i use powershell and it can fix the problem very quickly those are my lessons Yeah so yeah dba tools is uh dbatools.io um they've done so it's uh community driven open source uh the documentation is wonderful and even though it's it's free and from the community i would argue that the support is better than many tools that i've paid for over the years um so if if you're not using dba tools command lets to use powershell to help you administer your sql server environments uh deep these point is well taken it is awesome and very very helpful um do we have any questions no we don't have any question okay. but we okay. just have like one or two minutes left indeed okay uh well okay. so that's a perfect time for this slide then <laughs> so uh <laughs> these are all the various ways to find us uh like we mentioned feedback is is always welcome uh through whatever medium it is email twitter linkedin all of that uh we certainly hope that these stories from our background uh have helped uh hopefully some of them resonated with you and hopefully you're able to take some of the tips whether they're technical or whether they're personal from this um and help make your life as a dba and a data pro just a little bit easier